honor to welcome you all to this first session of the first edition of the Global Studies College. Uh, I'd like first of all to welcome very warmly uh, Professor Alessandro Stanziani, who is our first guest. And it is a great honor to have you uh, among us here at SEJ. I will just say uh, some brief words about this project and then my colleague in the organization of, uh, of this initiative, Miguel Geronimo, will uh, do the presentation of this session. So the um, uh, Global Studies College is a project that we have been preparing for some time already. Um, with the objective, which has as objective um, to engage researchers in a critical reflection and discussion uh, in interaction with uh, invited leading scholars from uh, various parts of the world and um, with an international reputation and impact uh, on, on their respective fields. So uh, the idea is to cover a wide range of topics uh, that have been um, uh, interesting for uh, SEJ researchers. For example, this year we'll have this uh, extremely important topic of labor, the worlds of labor. Uh, later on we'll have, um, uh, for, for our second session, uh, as invited, uh, our invited scholar will be uh, Professor Syed Farid Alatas from the University of Singapore. He will bring us a reflection on uh, Islam from a critical perspective, on dialogue south-south, on uh, other epistemologies uh, of sociology. Uh, and our third invited um, scholar for this year will be uh, Yvonne Gebara, um, a leading figure in uh, critical religious studies, also a historical and major personality in the liberation theology movement in Brazil, so we'll be very honored to host her here at SER, very important also for feminist studies. So as you can see, we are really trying to cover um, different aspects and different themes, um, um, all of them um, uh, I think will um, gather interest for, for, uh, from the researchers at SEJ and uh, the faculties in Coimbra and outside Coimbra who might be interested to, uh, in, that, in engaging in this dialogue. So, with no further words, I'd just like to say that uh, we um, have been very much encouraged by Professor Boaventura Sosa Santos to pursue this project, and I would like to um, express my warm gratitude also uh, in the name of uh, this uh, of my colleague Miguel Miguel. Um, we counted with Boaventura's uh, support from the outset of this project and our thoughts now go to him and uh, um, I think we could uh, dedicate this first session of the um, Global Studies College to Boaventura de Sousa Santos. Miguel, now the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Tiago. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, and I will try to make a brief presentation of Professor Stanzian. For us, uh, as Tiago already mentioned, it is a great pleasure to start our, uh, our collective uh, uh, Colégio de Estudos Globais with him. Uh, professor Stanzian is a professor of global history at the School of Advanced Studies in the Social Sciences and also a research director of the Cent uh, Centre National de Recherche Scientifique, CNRS, and is also the director of the Institute of Global Studies uh, uh, in Paris. He got first a PhD in economics uh, in Naples uh, in 1991, then a PhD in history uh, in 1995, and his uh, habitation was made at the University of Lille in 2003. 
His main interests and fields of expertise are, are I might, must say, uh, breathtaking. Global history, labor history, Russian history from the 16th to the 20th century, Indian Ocean labor, 18th and 19th centuries, economic, business and labor history in Europe, uh, France and Britain uh, from the eight, 18th century uh, um, uh, until early 20th century, and also an aspect extremely important, food history, especially in the 18th and uh, the 20th uh, century. In all of them, Professor Stanziani left and I think continues to leave a remarkable uh, impression. Uh, in all of them, he is one of the most uh, authoritative uh, voices. His publications, um, abundant publications, solidly uh, support this fact. Here are, here are some, uh, just some contributions, and I will skip, uh, keep myself to the published uh, books and edited volumes, uh, which are the majority of them uh, clear uh, major references uh, in the respective uh, uh, field. L'économie en révolution, le carus, uh, uh, the rules of exchange, French capitalism in a comparative uh, perspective, uh, les bâtisseurs uh, d'empire, Russie, Chine, uh, uh, published in 2012, bondage, labor and rights in Eurasia uh, from the 16th century to the 20th century. Um, a classic, I would say, after Oriental despotism dialoguing with a great classic of Wittfogel uh, and many other contributions to uh, world and global history called After Oriental Despotism, Warfare, Labour and Growth in Eurasia uh, from the 17th to the 20th century, and also Labour in the Fringes of Empire, uh, this book which has a lot to do with the presentation uh, or some aspects of the presentation that we will be uh, uh, glad to, to, to listen to uh, uh, today. I will also end by mentioning two important names, especially because we are a place in which these ideas are extremely uh, uh, well uh, thought of and, and dialogued and criticized and debated. The first volume uh, from 2018, uh, this wonderful uh, uh, intervention on the fields of global and world and history, a critical uh, look to all of them, uh, solidly based on uh, the, the current historiography, dialogue with diverse uh, fields of uh, uh, knowledge, but at the same time being extremely empirical in the, the examples mobilized in order to reflect ab about these important issues. And uh, uh, the, uh, uh, this great uh, uh, essay, I would call it Eurocentrism and the Politics of Global uh, history uh, that uh, I think will be useful for a lot of us that try to critically address the problem of Eurocentrism and the, and the production of uh, knowledge uh, of Eurocentric uh, and knowledge, but also the ways in which the academic world might indeed uh, intervene in some of these um, issues. Um, it would be impossible to mention even a small fraction of all the articles he, he, he published throughout the years uh, in great journals, Les Annales, uh, Comparative Studies in Society and History, Journal of Global History, International Review of Social History, Labor History, etc., etc., etc. And uh, today he will offer us uh, um, uh, um, a lecture on voice, exit and labor, a global perspective from the uh, uh, 17th century uh, to the early 20th century. Uh, uh, I'll shut up right now. The floor is yours. I'll go there because I want to learn as much as possible as well. And thank you so much. Thank you, Miguel, for the nice presentation and for the invitation. Thank you to all of you for spending the afternoon. You can do many other things, but you came. So I hope to, that you forgive me and I will do my best. So I'm really happy to stay here because, as I said during the trip from Lisbon to here, I spent my young uh, ages in Paris when I, I left Naples very young. I'm a Napolitan in Paris, and I, in Paris, my first years, I live in the Maison de Portugal. <laughs> so I spent my first years in Paris, not with French, but with Portuguese. And uh, I learned my French with Portuguese. So I speak a very strange French with a strange accent. People all the time say, this is not Mastroianni accent. Which kind of accent is it? And they say, it's a Napolitan and a Portuguese accent in French. <laughs> so forget about my French and... Uh, and uh, uh, and what I learned, but I'm still uh, very close to my Portuguese friends since the 80s in, in France. So I started from there. And so what I, I cannot talk, of course, about so many different things. Uh, some people 
still ask me, uh, do you know there is a guy with your name publishing on food history? And I said, yes, it's me, it's you. Uh, so, and this is all the time. So there is a kind of uh, segmentation in the historiography. And uh, this is a pity. Uh, one day I should write uh, how I try to connect these points. Not today, don't worry, but I know that my brain always was like a, a kind of ping pong. I, I see connections. Sometimes they are true, sometimes they are not true. Uh, we will discuss together. But anyhow, I work this way. So mm, people must uh, a little bit follow, but it's okay. In particular, my wife. So today I decided to focus on one point. Okay, I have a, a, a category, and this is important for this methodological point of view. And it's a tension that I always said because of my two PhD, but also because of the place where I teach. It's how do we handle categories coming from social sciences, which in principle move beyond boundaries, uh, uh, and a knowledge of uh, area studies with their own local languages and categories. It's always like this, as you know, if you can translate, uh, you know, uh, slave, we will say this in multiple languages, is this the same, not the same, and how I can cross. So, of course, you have uh, uh, different options to answer this. One option is a so-called externalist uh, vision. You identify your category in a critical way and after you test. Another way is to say how, the, as an historian, how the actors themselves used these categories and after trying to see uh, how these categories move in time and uh, how they shaped hierarchies themselves. So my problem, for example, all the discussions about free and free labor, whether people are really free or not free, this is good for our uh, normative ambitions today. For history, it can be a little bit different, not to say that maybe unfree were free and free were unfree. Of course, it's not well cut, but too much relativism also kill relativism. So my problem is that actors themselves were not so rigid as sometimes we think, and they used uh, categories, we will see, for example, to say that in India there were real slaves, and others say there were not real slaves. But who says so? There were these senior companies say something, some local elites some say something else. So it's not only scholars today in these debates, but actors themselves had similar debates and they used this category in context as a weapon. So my category today is runaway, fugitive people. It's just to talk about runaways. Uh, people run away. And they, as I never uh, sure uh, uh, about my language because I move between languages. Uh, even when I was a kid, I mean, in Naples we speak Napolitan and not Italian. So I'm never sure about uh, what I'm talking about. Okay, and and so I was. I always start with this. What does it mean uh, quality food for people at the time? So I was just surprised that the word runaways and fugitive was so widespread in many languages, in Russian, in English, in French, and so, but in many different places to talk about moving, uh, laboring people. So I just started, why moving, laboring people are fugitives and not migrants, for example. Sometimes, you know, you have migrants after they become refugees, after they become something else, but for two, three centuries, I found all around an obsession with the runaways. And runaways, even, we, we know runaways because of maroon slaves. This is the well known runaways, fugitive slaves. And this, this is relatively simple because they say, okay, they are slaves and they are runaway. But why do they use runaways for uh, many other people? Uh, apprentice, servants, uh, day labor, they are all runaways. So something is wrong. So why runaways? So I started with the with uh, this uh, basic idea. So I have a, a basic uh, argument. In, in normal uh, historiography of social sciences of runaways, you have two categories. You have the maroon slaves and you have the soldiers. The conscripts, they are runaways. These are accepted by everybody. But what about all the others? So if we take all the other of runaways, I think that we can discuss of the following. 
Uh, we have slaves, serf, indentured immigrant, and bonded person. Everybody is a runaway, can be a runaway. Okay? So, the first uh, answer is that it's a, a kind of uh, uh, Thompson story, E.P. Thompson story, that runaways and fugitives uh, are express resistance. I agree, and at the same time, it's resistance to what? If we follow E.P. Thompson, it's resistance to what? To oppression, to coercion, or to the industrial world. Uh, this is the normal E.P. Thompson story. People go away because they resist the proletarization in the industrial world and industrial discipline. This was the... I think this is true, but it, to me, uh, runaways, uh, um, it's also expressed as something a little bit more uh, troubling. Uh, because for Thompson, if you say that this is a resistance against something, you have a before and a after. My argument is a little bit different, is that uh, runaways express uh, something which is not before and after. It's something which persists over three centuries, and uh, three centuries and a half, at least, between the 17th century in the late 19th century, there are runaways everywhere. So it's not just the beginning of industrialization, it's also the first industrial revolution with the runaways. So the E.P. Thompson story is true, but it's not true at the same time. Something doesn't work. It's, it's not only the industrial way. And so my idea is that the runaways everywhere, the global history of the runaways, is it's a way of discussing the relationship between three things, the, the relationship between the economic order, the political inclusion, exclusion, I'm coming back in a moment on this, and third, the social stability. It's three different stories which are connected through the runways. These are the categories, and the phenomenon which are related to this political stability and so on and so forth are First, what is called modernization, to be critical, so it's the P. Thompson story, but it's modernization to me plus uh, imperial uh, uh, expansion, plus the revolution, plus industrialization. So I have four uh, processes behind the runways, okay? Not just only the industrialization, but also the, uh, what is the colonial, the, the empire building. It's important to understand the runways and also the transformation of societies, which is not just the industry. There is something more. So, in order to understand what is the more, okay, I'll skip about my areas. So, I will try to connect the different areas, starting from the easiest one, uh, and moving into the less uh, easy to say runways. So, I start with uh, uh, Russia, but after I move to Britain, so for Russia, it's relatively easy to say, okay, you have surf, then runways. So in Russian case, it's easy. But actually, as I started with Russia, it's not easy, the Russian case. It, it's not easy because uh, this is, okay, uh, this is my archives, it's a picture, but it's okay. The Russian case is, officially, you have the introduction of serfdom in the 17th century, and the usual argument is that you introduce serfdom, because Russia wants to answer to the development of the West, and instead of putting uh, technical innovation, they uh, use more coercion on local people, and they produce more wheat for the West. This is the Wallerstein and Kula argument, okay? It doesn't work. It doesn't work for different reasons. Uh, if you take the runways, you have many serfs moving around Russia under surfing. Okay? So I start with Ramos and say, why people move around? The first is that they move around and they are very hardly recovered. So why fugitive surf are so many fugitive surf and uh, nobody tries to keep them? They scream, but they go on moving around. The first reason is that uh, estate owners uh, promised better condition to uh, peasants <coughs> of your neighbor, 
and you will find the same argument in the colonial world. And the peasants serf moved from uh, uh, estates where the conditions were worse to estates where they thought the conditions were better. Okay? Usually, and this is very important for the from social sciences in particular, they moved from small to big estates. Because everywhere we will find the same in the colonial world, the small were very ugly. They were very few serfs, very few will see slaves, and they used very coercive methods to extract something. And if one escapes, you are dead. If you have five slaves and two go away, you are dead. If you have 3,000 slaves, you don't care. But people moved not to be free, but moved to the big estates where, in principle, they were supposed to have better conditions. Okay? After we can discuss if the better conditions was because those people were smart and they promised better conditions to keep more peasants, or if because they were big and they have what the economists call the economies of scale, and so they can, have, they can be more relaxed more free because they have more people and so they can benefit of economies of scale. So this is also for the future if you are more liberal because you are big or you are big because you are liberal. Of course this is ideological, you can never prove one of this, but there is this connection between the two. Whatever it is, a peasant moved, the police arrived, and you have this in the archives, and the small estate owners said that the police uh, 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 had a collusion with the big estate owners because they said that the police found the people and they said we didn't find the people. So they said, you see, you are friends with the big estate owners, my peasants move there and you don't keep. But this means that serfdom is not exactly serfdom because people moved and actually what the big did and also the small was a kind of racketing. Uh, uh, serfdom wor worked like a mafia and it was the same in the medieval period in Europe. You have a long list of interdictions, okay? But peasants could overcome all the interdictions if they paid. It was a completely different story. So it's not true that they were bound to the land. Uh, the big entries of most estate owners were the fees that they get from peasants moving around, going to town to work, going to the other to work, and they said, okay, you can do it, give me a fee, and give me a percentage of this. And they move all around. Okay? So the first reason was what the uh, estate owners called the um, unfair competition, and that we will find the same argument in Britain as well. The, or in France, the debauchage was the obsession. You take my workers. Okay? So the first reason was this mobility between and the unfair competition between the state owners. It was a whole, I mean it was a coercive system, but with the limits, as they wanted labor, they were ready to keep labor from the others. They didn't respect the rules themselves and said, I'm the bigger what you want. So and in this hole, people moved. They were not free, they were not stable serf. They moved inside the system. You can decide free and free is not a problem, but they moved this way. The second reason, the second re reason why they moved was colonialism, the uh, Russian imperial expansion. If you occupy the steppe, you need people over there. And you want to put Russian people there. How do you put Russian people if they are serf in the middle of Russia. So, fugitive peasants said that they promised land for us. They moved. Local authorities, what I found in their cousins, we found a lot of peasants apparently are from Petrograd, are from this region, from the region. What do we do? The local authorities said, no, no, no. You, you send a couple of them, all the others stay. We need them for the step. So, the second reason and they have to negotiate the uh, authorities. It's not by chance that the big estate owners and also small estate owners of the center of Russia were against the colonial expansion because they said, you keep my peasants. Either officially, because of uh, military recruitment, they took peasants and they put in the state, and the people in the center of Russia say, it's my peasants, you take for colonization, what I do? Other people were runaways, and they were never recovered. 
Uh, so it means that the, the uh, official ideal type of uh, Cephalon doesn't match with the Russian expansion. You cannot, you cannot have the two. So you must have a flexible Cephalon to have Russian colonialism, otherwise it doesn't work. And so you have a few people in Russia, but spreading around with the benediction of the state and with the help of the state, and after saying, we didn't find. So, two important reasons. So, an unfair competition for runaways, and the other was colonial expansion. Okay? There is another uh, reason, it, and this is very important. This means that the Russian expansion in the frontier is completely different than the uh, British or French or Portuguese. I'm going to explain. It's not the Turner frontier, it doesn't work. It doesn't work at all, the Turner frontier for Russia. It's something very different. The difference is that people on the frontier had much less constraints than people in the core in Russia. Peasants who accepted to move to the frontier, they had the status of state peasants, not private peasants, which means that they were entitled to have the land. They were kind of peasant soldiers. They were there, they were official soldiers, but they were also free peasants, and they had the land. Now, the American way, before the end of the 19th century, when we have the official image of the frontier and freedom, before the date, was the other way around. People on the frontier were what? Uh, white indentured, I'm coming back in a moment, and slaves. Which means that in Britain as in France, the condition in the core were far better than the condition on the frontier. Okay, when the east part of the Eurasia, as I call it, Britain and France are still Eurasia, but are the east part moved through the Atlantic, they moved what? Convicts, prisoners, soldiers, indentured, and after slaves. So people were in worse condition than working people in Britain. <coughs> the Russians did the other way around. They had more coercion on the core, despite this informal uh, circulation, and less coercion on the frontier. Okay, so it was a completely different approach to the so the meaning of runaways was completely different, but not because of the ideal type of serfdom against the freedom. Okay? The runaways of Russia were more free than the runaways of the West at that time, for these reasons. Okay? Why? Why is it so? The first reason for the West is the connection between, again, the military and the labor market. Okay? As I said, these runaways are categories used for slave, serf, and military. The fugitive are, first of all, the deserters. The, use, the using of the word deserter. Why a, a, a laboring guy is a deserter? But the, the word was used. And it was used because, as in the Russian frontier, the West itself uh, overlapped the... Uh, um, Okay, this is uh, what they overlapped the military and the labor market. So to me it's important that for the, in particular the 16th, 17th century, the overlapping of the two markets, it's absolutely crucial uh, in both sides of Eurasia. Okay, the Russians did it, the Chinese did it, they occupied the step with the military and peasant soldiers. These are the so-called the land empires. Okay? Now, in the historiography and political sciences, you have this opposition between the uh, uh, land empires and the maritime empires. Land empires are the Vitfogel and the despotism, and the maritime empires are the future, the progress and modernity, Britain. It's not true. Uh, first, because the land empires in the frontier used the less coercion. The maritime empire used the, not, of course, the peasant soldiers, but they used the, the seamen, seamen, colonizers, slash slaves. So, I want to have a look at the correspondence for France and uh, uh, Britain of the military and labor market on the frontier, in particular for seamen, okay? uh, which people are sent out.
Now, the first start with France. In, in France, you have a, a very slow decline of the galleys. Officially, the galleys uh, disappear with the 17th century. Actually, they go on in the 18th century. And after, they are transformed into convicts from uh, Dunkirk, from any other places. You have prisoners put on the boats. So they still use during the 18th century this attitude. The second form of recruitment in France was an imitation of uh, uh, um, Britain, the press. In other words, you go into local towns along the sea and you keep everybody who mo moves around. So it's a kind of forced recruitment against local uh, communities of fishermen and so on and so forth. So you have a, a kind of forced uh, recruitment. If you have a forced recruitment, you have a lot of deserters among seamen in France. They were recruited under coercion and they escaped. The rate of desertion, even in the, uh, not only in the Royal uh, Navy, but also in the um, commercial Navy, was extremely high for different reasons. The first the first is that uh, some of the people were recruited by uh, coercion. The second reason is that when you developed uh, the long distance uh, 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 fisheries, you know, in the far north, it's no more the sardine along the coast, it's far. It's the famous stories of the bacayao, you must go far north. But this means that it's no more the traditional fishermen of the coast. It's completely different people spending months away. They change technically the ships and they start recruiting uh, uh, people who are called by real marin pêcheur, by real fishermen, they are called matelots because they are kind of people without skills, but they are good for la morue, again, very far. Who are those people? Those people are occasionally people from the, uh, the countryside that uh, during the dead season or during bad years decide to move to the coast to find a job and they are sent away for six months, seven months. It's a completely different kind of uh, recruitment. But those people, again, are not happy of having a longer contract of two, three years when you have the wheels and some sort of Moby Dick stories it's again a different uh, form of coercion over years. And so the long-term uh, distance uh, fishermen introduce something new. And the other story is the coexistence in the same boats of uh, more or less white people forcibly recruited and slaves. Uh, when these boats go away from the coast of France or Britain, they recruit laptops in Africa or Indian sailors. They recruit. They keep by strength local uh, uh, fishermen. They put on boat, and after they throw out on boat before coming back to Europe. So there is a forced recruitment of slaves or fishermen treated as slaves, and after sold out before coming back. So. For France, it's extremely strong. And for Britain, it's even worse because they use the press on a massive scale. So the press is extremely important in Britain and it's used by private and by public. So all of them, including the East Indian Company, they use the press, which means forced recruitment uh, in different uh, uh, localities. Of course, this creates a lot of problems and creates a lot of problems first from a legal point of view. Because from many uh, uh, local communities, they say this is against the Magna Carta. You cannot just keep people in the street and put on a boat. The answer of justice was that the Magna Carta doesn't apply when the national security is involved and uh, the name is national security. So that's the problem. And you have a lot of uh, uh, sentences and decision on, the, on this problem. The second is that uh, uh, 
there was a debate whether uh, you can treat uh, British uh, sailors as slaves and kidnapping everywhere. The answer of the uh, abolitionist movement, and in particular the evangelists and Quakers, as you know they were the origin of the abolitionists, when they discussed about uh, uh, Simon, they said slaves are innocent people, uh, like children, you know the argument that uh, the slave is innocent, is like a child, they are taken from Africa and brought there. The seamen are a junkyard, uh, full of sin, they deserve this. So the abolitionist movement refused to enter into this kidnapping of uh, uh, seamen by saying that they, if they are kidnapped, it's because they are drunk. And if they are drunk, they deserve this. So it was only in the uh, uh, 70s and the 80s of the 19th century that the attitudes changed in Britain, very late. Okay? So the seamen, it's, it's really something, all the powerful uh, uh, expansion of France and Britain in particular was based upon forced recruitment of slaves and the British themselves. Okay? But at the same time they used the word fugitive because they started and they tried in France as in Britain to overlap rules for uh, uh, seamen and rules for normal workers. And this is where the, my story becomes interesting. So beyond uh, uh, seamen, beyond serf, there were normal laboring people who were treated in the same way. And the question is, how was it possible to treat this way? The first is that in Britain, as you know, the Master and Servants Acts were there, uh, were even increased, were, were not like the liberal or the weak uh, historiography, say, an heritage of medieval, never used. There were some medieval, but there were new Master and Servants Acts, which were adopted in the 18th century, in the first industrial revolution, in order to keep people there. And they were enforced until the mid of the 19th century, and there were criminal uh, penal rules. So labor contract was not uh, a, a civil contract, was a penal. Penal means that if you move without the authorization of the master, you are under criminal penalties, and you are a runaways and a deserter. So it's extremely important that for apprentice and normal servants, uh, this kind of rules and uh, words were used, but also practice. They were extremely practiced. We have now detailed um, archival uh, details and statistics, county by county, on how much did they enforce these rules. And they enforced the rules, they have no problem. And they have problems with the two store. Why they need this? Why a servant? and to stay there. Always I say it's a kind of like a, a, a kind of, a, a, you know, the ideal marriage of macho people. You must stay here when I like and you must go away when I don't like. For masters of the time, it was exactly the same. I need labor when I need and I kick you off when I don't need you. Okay? So, you say this is an ideal world, but it worked because rules were adopted and enforced along this way. We have no real voice from laboring people, including Britain, despite the, um, the glorious revolution. We have no rights for people, but we have a lot of rights for masters, non-employers. They are called masters. The word employers is very late. It was, it's, the, it's the turn of the 19th, 20th century. Before there were masters and servants, not workers, wage earners, and employers. They were called different because they were masters with strongly unequal rights. So I disagree with people who criticize the liberal attitude by saying there is a, a, a formal equality and, and, in, and, 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 and social inequality in front of the law. I disagree because inequality was already in the law. It's not true that there was equality in front of the law. The master and servants was not the contract, there was a status. They have a legal status which was different. We know the different legal status for slaves, they have no rights, they are no persons, on. but the servants have a, have a different legal status than the masters. They cannot sue, they cannot, they have very few rights and many obligations. And it was by status, not by contract. So it was extremely important. And the question is, why, why so? 
my answer, I'm not uh, making so many, uh, uh, I'm not entering into uh, these details, but my answer is that actually we should use the so-called revisionist approach to the industrial revolution. The first industrial revolution was labor intensive. Okay? It's not true what Marx and many others have more capital. This is the second one. The first re requested more labor, not less labor. Everybody wanted labor. Proto industry wanted labor, the manufacturer was the large manufacturer. Of course, you have all the chartists streaming against machines. But this is not like today, you know, on the internet, it's because you have the novelty and people stream their games. After you see how many machines there are in Britain until the mid 19th century, very few, even in textile. <coughs> everybody wanted labor and wanted labor there. So everybody screams against everybody to say, you kept my workers. And there were continuous lawsuits and tensions between masters to say, you kept my workers. You have not the right, they are my workers, they are servants and they are sued by penalties. And it was all the time like this. So it's very important to say that it's not only slavery or the plantations or the Russia, but even Britain, even more France, were labor intensive. So there were several reasons for coercion and runaways. Runaways is because you have a very small voice. But why do you have runaways and coercion? You have runaways and coercion. First, because everybody wants labor, and this is what the economists would say. But there are other reasons. It's not enough to have demand of labor for having coercion and runaways. You need more. And the second reason was that labor was cheap. And was cheap not because there were so many proletarians. Actually, there were not enough. This was against any law of demand and supply. Labor was cheap because rules were settled in a way that people could not even ask for increasing wages. It's, they have no voice for requiring wages. It's, it's very simple. And these rules were enforced not because everybody was ugly and evil and so on, but because labor was considered as a service, not only for the state, but for any master, including your father. If you work for your father, labor was a service and a duty to the family. The idea of labor as service was socially accepted, and this was a strong ground for allowing the enforcement of rules. Otherwise, as you know, you can vote all the rules you want. People do not use them. But people used in Britain because they believed that labor was a service. And all of them believed. But at the same time, it was like in Russia, even if they were not served, OK? I, mean, I never say this. So they were not served. But it was like in Russia, if you are so interested in labor, you are ready to pick the workers of other people. And this is where runaways can enter. And you can, so if this is the only way of escaping, it is not a big door, okay? So it's important to acknowledge this door, the unfair competition between people, precisely because everybody wants labor and because it's coercion. But at the same time, if this is the only way you have, you are not in a, such a wonderful world, like but runaways is the only voice that you have. You have no other choices. But this was because of this pressure and this obsession with labor development. Okay? France is a little bit different, not because they are better, I'm going to back in a moment, but just because, what is France here? You know, after. Okay. So, uh, uh, France is a little bit different. They have no criminal penalties. So, you see, France is, is the paradise. Criminal penalties are abolished with the revolution. Okay? But France has something different. They have uh, uh, still desertion for vagabond. So, uh, vagabond, everybody's a vagabond in France. So, it's not in the labor contract, but you have the vagabond. And you have the Livret Ouvrier, which is the worker booklet. It's a kind of booklet with the, which you work and you move around. And you are always in a debt. You are in debt. Why? Because you have advances on wages. And this is crucial in Britain, in particular in France. Advances on wages. This was the way it worked in the 19th century. Wages were at the end of the period. 
but you can ask in advances. If you ask in advances, you are in debt with your master. And if you are in debt, debt is criminal, it's no more commercial. So in principle in France you have no criminal penalties for workers. Except if, if a worker was in debt. Because in this case it is no the labor contract, it's the credit contract. But all the workers were in debt by definition. And so you have this booklet in order to control where people were moving and they were in debt. So in France you have a, a different uh, approach. You have not officially criminal penalties, but they pass through uh, debt. And the second difference is that in town, the Prudhomme, the industrial uh, law courts, defended uh, really laboring people. But this was in some town and big in textile. In the countryside, they were without the protection of Prudhomme. So in Britain, everybody was under the master and servants. In France, you have a big division between the countryside and some town, okay, in terms of defense and voice of labor. So some workers, before the acknowledgement of trade unions, were really defended by Proudhon, but not the others. So it's an important division in France between the two. So what I'm trying to show is that uh, for a long time, uh, the colonial rules were inspired by mainland rules. So it's not true that it was the pure freedom on one end and the pure freedom on the other end. Uh, what the French and the British did was to expand the uh, 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 mainland rules to the colonies, but in an extreme way. Before slavery, they used the indenture. And indenture labor, you know, you, uh, someone pay for your trip, and in exchange you work seven years with no wages, and you can be sold and transferred. Of course, if you have some debts, during seven years the debt will be longer and longer. And this was for white. So the 17th century was full of those people. And when they invented them, both sides, France and Britain, indentured contract, or they say we mix two kinds of contracts. The seamen, because of the long-term service, and the journalier, or the daily laborer in the countryside. Because they must go there and défricher the land, and prepare the land, and clear the lands. So the invention of the contract of the indenture, they were only written contracts, was a mixing of my stories, which means the fishermen and the daily laborer in the countryside. And this was the indenture. Okay? And indenture was the idea of freedom before and after slavery. When the French and the British had say what we have after slavery, we have indenture. This is free. It's very important because today people say this is not free labor. Probably not. But this is not my point. My point is that for the actors of the time, the indenture was considered a free contract because it was opposed to slavery. Okay? It became, for the actors themselves, an unfree contract only after the abolition of slavery, when the abolitionist movement said, okay, we have no more slaves. Are the indentured really free? No, they are not free. But so there was a shift in what freedom meant for the actors themselves. Okay? In order to identify the indentured as an unfree, you must first abolish slavery. Under slavery, the indentured was the example of freedom. Okay? After you can decide for you so happy to move for seven years without pain. But for them it was the idea of freedom because you choose. It's the idea of free will. Okay? You use as a e choose to move there. He signed the contract, free will, mm -hmm. free contract, freedom. Okay? It's extremely important this English idea of what freedom was. It's a completely different uh, that's what idea of liberty. And I insist on this because people say there is a contradiction uh, in this abolitionist movement. Uh, look at Thomas Jefferson. He spoke of universal rights and he had slaves. 
I don't ask questions. I say, why am I contradictory? I don't, I don't see. First of all, those people, I'm not sure they are human beings. And we have huge debates about this. Uh, I have friends working on the orangutan in the 18th century. It's not a joke. It's a real problem. Where is the boundary, the human and the animal? And when do you put the Negro inside this? If they're not a soul, they are no slaves. So the first is the color and the, and the soul. No soul, no slaves. And the second is that precisely, you see, I don't see. For me, freedom is liberty. Liberty of freedom, li liberty of trade. So the US independence is about liberty, not freedom. Uh, we want free trade and not pay custom to Britain. We are free, but free as liberty. This is luck. It's nothing to do with slavery, nothing. And it's perfectly compatible with slavery. So I don't like the word contradiction because it's our world. In their world, there was no contradiction. They were for liberty. So it's important, I see, that even today for the Americans, you can speak of liberty, universal liberty, and put Peones and all the others in prison because they don't see any contradiction. In the Lockean approach, it was perfectly coherent to a slaves and liberty. It's not for everybody, that story. So it's, uh, it's important to make this distinction. Okay? So this world change it. I'm going to finish, otherwise we have no discussion. Change it uh, 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 with the great transformation of labor uh, at the end of the 19th century. So we had the world made of runaways everywhere because coercion was extremely important. Why this world collapsed? collapsed for, uh, at least in Europe, for some simultaneous reason. The first is that politically you have more unions, more rights, more political voice for working people. More political voice and increasing wages meant also new rules on labor. And you have the end of the Master and Servants Act, in France it was the end of the Loire de Brage and the Service, in Germany it was the same, and something new was invented, which is what's called the contrat de travail, the labor contract, as we know today. It was an invention of the end of the 19th century with formally equal rights on the two sides, no more obligation and labor as service, no more time sold to my master, and also the legal acknowledgement of trade unions. So it means more voice for working people. So they became no more, there were no more servants, there were wage earners, a, a different story, with protection and the first welfare. This was also so because of the entering of the state and the first welfare, but third was of course the second industrial revolution. With the second industrial revolution, you have more capital and less labor. So the pressure on labor is much less than under the first industrial revolution. So it's another world, and it changes simultaneously. You have more political rights, increasing cost of labor, and immediately after, as a response, concentration of uh, industry, and because of this, less labor, and so on and so forth. So, but the problem is that this was very unequal. It was very unequal for different reasons. It's more voice, I agree, less runaways, no more runaways in Europe, but for whom? The welfare was not universal before 45, uh, and even after 45 with women and so on. So. But anyhow, at the turn of the century, the first welfare in Britain, as in France, was for some workers of the unionized workers of some industries. All the others were out. No universal welfare. Some industries. Second, completely excluded all the artisans the small units, the women, and the countryside. Peasants, no works, no welfare. Artisans are not workers, no welfare. So there was an exclusion, an important exclusion. In Britain, as in France. So a very selective welfare, mm -hmm. which creates important inequalities inside working people. It's not by chance that the uh, victims of the second industrial revolution, as you know, and the excluded from the welfare, 
were at the origin of fascism and communism after the First World War. You have the old estate owners surviving until there, as I said, the master and servants and so on. But you have the artisans, most of them became fascists or communists, depends on the area. You have the excluded peasants. So this is the 20th century. So my idea is that because of this very late transformation of the world, is not the end of the 18th century or beginning of the 19th century. I'm very close to Arno Meyer for very old people here. Arno Meyer said that the old regime in Europe finished with the First World War. I agree. There were aristocracies all the time, and there was an agreement between aristocracies and capitalism until the First World War. It was only after that that it broke. <coughs> but so it means that in this way you can better explain all the fascism and communism in Europe because it was very late the explosion. It was not one century before and after you have a deviation one century after that. It doesn't work, the normal explanation. You have one century of interval between the great transformation and the fascism and communism. It doesn't work. With my scheme, they were still there and they collapsed only with the first world war. That's why you have all these tragedies in the beginning of the 20th century. But they were the third excluded from the welfare and this is the colonial war. No welfare for the colonial people. It's the uh, last book I had. It's at the end of the 19th century, when you introduced the first welfare for some workers in Europe, the debate was what we do with the colonies and the labor in the colonies. Are in the new labor contract or out? The answer everywhere was they're out. They are not ready, they are not civilized for having the new labor contract. Even socialists were again because they said, first you must stop with imperialism, so the good solution is to stop with colony. But if you keep the colonies, you must first educate them, otherwise we have unfair competition with our workers. Jaurès was pretty clear, you give the same rights to Africans after the salaries in France will collapse. So the stop immigration, including on the left side today, is since the very origin of the welfare. The welfare was a national, for the first time, the nation on the labor was there. Until there, the nation was for romantic people and for independence, not for workers. The workers were international. But with welfare, you became national because you have national right. Uh, you must be a resident to have the welfare. Uh, otherwise, it's the parish, you have very local protection as before, some charity, nothing. If you want the welfare, you must stop all the immigrants, otherwise you cannot pay for the welfare for everybody. And so this argument was from the very beginning. And so he excluded the colonies, and this was until the independence of the colonies. As you know, I don't know about Portugal, but France and Britain discussed this only in the late 40s, early 50s of the 19th century, when the colonies were going away, say, wait, 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 we're giving even welfare to you. It was a little bit too late, but it was very uh, partial and very limited. Okay? So this was the very bad issue of the turn of the 19th and 20th century, and I think that we still pay the consequences of this uh, bifurcation at that moment. Okay. Finish. Finish. Thanks so much.